Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume and I'm absolutely overjoyed to be able to share this with you guys because it is, we're getting into my favorite years and I'm stoked and I, and I went back and forth on how we're going to do this, whether we're going to just do one individual year and I just do like a top five, but I'm going to lump them together uh, because this is going to be an epic video and I think you know, just looking at some of the fragrances on this list brings a tear to my eye. I mean, these are heavy, heavy hitters in my mind. It's a top 16, so it's not like it's anything crazy. It's only a top 16, and we're going from the years 1976 until 1978. So there's only three years in this video. Uh, and if you remember, we started out with decades. Well, first we started out with all fragrances before the 1920s. Then we did the Roaring Twenties, the Thirties, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Once we got to the 70s, I chopped it in half and we started from 70 to 75. So we did five years. Now we're down to three. I'm pretty sure the next couple videos, we're going to be down to a couple years or even just one uh, because we're getting into really the meat of my collection. And uh, I, I am just, you know, just to be able to talk about these and show them. I even grabbed backups so we can show different versions. I'm excited, let's put it that way, because these vintage fragrances are where my heart is really at uh, in the perfume world. Uh, the way that the fragrances smell, the love, the attention to detail, the discontinued rare nature of them, you know, the um, just everything, the way they were created, the, the, the fact that they had balls back in the day. These vintage fragrances we're going to talk about had balls, whether they're feminine fragrances, which bookend the list, the, the, the bottom end of the list is a feminine fragrance, and the very top end of the list is a feminine fragrance, and all of the masculines in between, they all have balls. Uh, they uh, were not afraid to say something back in the day, to make a statement, you know, these are statement maker perfumes, uh, and they really tell who you are, and they tell people just what impeccable taste you have. If someone smells this on you, these type of fragrances, any of them on this list, they will know exactly what type of taste you have. And um, so I'm excited to go through these. My scent of the day is actually in this list. It's what prompted me to do the video today because I've been rotating a bunch of videos. And um, so, but first we're gonna talk about some world events that happened in 1976, 77, and 78. In 1976, some major events that took place in the world. Number one, Apple was formed by uh, the late Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Uh, crazy to think that was 1976 and um, a couple other things the first Concorde flight took off uh, Rocky was released the very first Rocky was 1976 crazy Jimmy Carter wins the presidential election and I know he is um, uh, in hospice right now and I think he's in his late 90s so what a beautiful life he lived no matter what your politics are you know you have to kind of tip your hat to a great human being, and um, NASA unveiled the uh, first space shuttle, the Enterprise, um, and there were a couple other things, but those were kind of the big ones that jumped out to me in, in 1976. Now, in 1977, Star Wars opens in cinema. I mean, you know, in my mind, when I think about these films, Rocky and Star Wars, they seem like they're ancient, right? Because uh, I'm, I'm 37. And, but when I, when I see 1977, I'm like, that doesn't seem like that long ago. I mean, I know it is, but it doesn't seem like it. Apple II computers go on sale. Um, uh, Elvis Presley died at, and at the age of 42 in 1977. Uh, what else happened? The New York blackout happened in, in um, 1977. That was a major event that lasted 25 hours. In uh, 1978... In 1978, um, what happened? In, did anything happen in 78? Teddy, Ted Bundy, the serial killer, was captured in 78. Um, and the uh, couple, uh, couple bands that were formed in 78 were noteworthy. Duran Duran, probably the most famous from, for me that I can appreciate. Duran Duran, uh, Simple Minds, UB40, Dead Kennedys, Dead... Uh, Dexy Midnight Runners, um, the Space Invaders video game came out in 78, and after 30 years of production, the Volkswagen Beetle was halted in Germany, and so just, you know, looking at some of these events, it's crazy. 
thinking how far back in time these are. Um, part of me wishes I would have been alive during, I think, I think the uh, personality that I have would have fit better in that world. Today's world, everyone is so sensitive, you know. Uh, I probably offended somebody by something I said within the first five minutes of this video. I just don't know it, you know, and I don't know what it is. And even if I did, I wouldn't care because I uh, I wouldn't let what someone else thinks, you know, change who I am. Uh, they don't want to change who they are, and I don't want to change who I am, right? And uh, it's just, it's, it's you know, it's the world we live in nowadays. But I couldn't be sharing this with you on a phone that I could just click play if we lived in the 70s and 80s. Um... And so there is that give and take. It was a different world back then, although it seems like a simpler time. I know that uh, even you could go back thousands of years, mankind, man, mankind, I say that in the biblical sense, man, not men, but mankind, we kind of are who we are, you know what I mean? Our DNA hasn't changed for hundreds of thousands of years. We think we're this uh, big technologically advanced, forward-thinking people, but really I think at the heart of it, uh, we, we are, we are who we are as humans. Uh, we just have fancy gadgets now, but, uh, I really think that at least in the old days, it just feels like people still connected more. You know, it feels like, um, with, with only having, let's say three TV channels and you didn't have this device you could carry around with you that just had all information right at the palm of your hands, that the person to person connection was more. And that's what I like about thinking about the older times, you know, and how things were back in the day. Um, and, you know, kids playing outside instead of just sitting on video games all day. And, and you know, it's that kind of uh, idea, right? And so I think even though people didn't have as much, maybe they didn't have as much um, uh, stuff, they didn't have as much stuff that was made in China, they didn't have as many gadgets, let's say, they weren't as wealthy, they may not have had as much money in the bank, but I think overall, people were happier. Um, a, a family could survive with one person working, now it seems like most families need multiple people working, uh, and it just seems like kind of the erosion of the average uh, family, if you will, as time has gone on. And so I do look back on those days somewhat fondly, maybe because I wasn't around, you know, Maybe it's um, a false sense of, um, you know, a false sense. Of, I'm, I'm seeing things through rose-colored glasses. But I do love these that that time, that era. And maybe that's what really also attracts me to these fragrances. So let's get started. So uh, this is going to be a top 16. And every single one of these fragrances is amazing. It was almost impossible for me to rank this. I've changed it and changed it back and changed it again and switched things around and moved things and you know, more times than you can imagine, but I think I've settled on something that I feel comfortable with. You know, I don't think it's ever going to be right and ask me tomorrow and the and the story may change. But as of right now, Friday, March 3rd of 2023, this is my top 16 list and it's ranked from 1976 to 1978. So we have three years encompassed. So first of all, we're going to start with the fragrance from 1977. And I have three bottles of this because I got such a steal. The person sold them to me for like, I don't know, 30 bucks a piece or something. I couldn't say no. I had $30 for a vintage discontinued floral Shepra uh, from a house I really respect. I couldn't say no, you know, even if it was probably, they wanted to sell all three at that price, so I took them. Uh, actually, I might have gotten four. I can't remember. But this is a fragrance by the house of Leonard from 1977, and it's called Tamango. Tamango de Leonard. These are 60 mil splashes. You can see the... Um, short ingredient list, if you will. And um, so this is a floral green fragrance. There's bergamot, there's spice. It opens up very green, but not like, um, not like, you know, the resinous galbanum green. It's not like that. It's more like a freshness, like uh, crushed leaves green, you know, rose and carnation and the greenness from the flowers too. Imagine you're smelling like the bulb that the rose sits in, the greenness of the carnation. There is a beautiful iris note in here, and there's a lovely muguet note. Although those aren't my favorite, you know, type of, these type of scents, these very floral heavy scents are not my favorite. This is still a beautiful fragrance. Jasmine and oak moss and sandalwood and amber and tonka bean. 
Um, and it's a lovely fragrance, probably more traditionally feminine. I think this would smell amazing on a woman in a position of power, um, or just, you know, hanging out with friends. But yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tamango, but it has to be last on this list because it is up against some stiff competition. Um, the, I'm looking at the fragrances and it's like, holy moly, what, what a, what a countdown this is. So Tamango just, uh. Just has to be last. No question even about it in my mind. Although it's still a really good perfume, it just can't hang with the other big hitters. Okay, so that was number 16. Number 15 is a fragrance we talked about recently because I did a video on Alberto Morias. And this is one of his fragrances. Actually, this is the first Alberto Morias, or the oldest, I should say, in my collection. And I think the oldest even that I know of. That was a big hit anyways. And this kind of was a hit. It came out in the year 1978, and it's called Homme de Café. Now, Homme de Café um, is a cheapie, a big cheapie. It uh, can be had for $10. I mean, that kind of cheapie, right? Uh, I, if you can find older bottles that actually say COFCI here on the front, I think that's what you want. I think the newer ones, they kind of took it away, and you've got to see it on the bottom now. But either way... You know, for 10 bucks, this is still just, you know, take a punt on it, see what happens. It's woody, it's spicy, it's kind of earthy. Um, the spice is the main thing, though. And the spice here comes from this uh, clove leaf, right? There's like this clove, uh, raspberry, and wood combination. And it's slightly musky. Think of the 70s musk. Look at the color profile. I mean, just screams 1970. Don't think about the coffee beans on the front being anything more than marketing for the house. This is not a coffee fragrance. The house is literally called Parfums Cafe, and so the coffee beans on the front are indicative of the name, uh, but this is not a coffee fragrance, okay? So keep that in mind. But um, it's crazy seeing, you know, if you have a lot of Alberto Mordias fragrances because he's been around for so long, you can kind of see his growth. You know, you can see how he's come along in his own style and how he's formed his own personal style and this is very very early on but i think this is a good fragrance if you like spicy fragrances um this is definitely one to check out that clove leaf note is very unique very interesting um Homme de cafe from 1978 comes in at number 15. number 14 is a fragrance that does not get a, enough hype. It does not get enough love. And I think it's because it's kind of a weird name. It was put out by the house of Orlane. And, or I think originally the house was known as Jean d'Albert. But uh, I, I think you'll mostly see it known as Orlane now. Orlane Paris. And this particular fragrance is called Derek. So Derek comes in this bottle that looks almost like an old gas can. You know, almost like those old gasoline cans. And uh, I think the older bottles have the name up here, Derek, instead of this way. But I still really like this. It's kind of this spicy, woody. Uh, this fragrance has a very unique feature in that it has a vetiver top note. Normally, vetiver is used in the base because it's a very long-lasting note. Kind of um, keeps going into the dry down. They stuck vetiver, cinnamon, pepper, and cedar in the top. And while this smells very 70, again, look at the color scheme, brown, see? Look at these browns, you know, these very, um, almost like you're gonna just go sit down on a plaid couch or something, you know, and wear your jacket with your elbow pads. You know, it's that kind of uh, design. Uh, they would never design uh, a bottle like this today. This is way too rugged and masculine. And that's probably one of the reasons why I love it so much. It almost looks like an old school gas can, like, you know, the ones that you would see on Call of Duty World War II games where you're going to go fill up your, you know, bring your gas can to fill up your tank if it runs out of, uh, you know, fuel. That kind of vibe, right? Uh, there's coriander. So there's some herbal coriander. There's some fresh ginger. There's some nutmeg, which blends beautifully with the pepper. And there's some patchouli, which makes it, you know, have some heft. There is some heft to this, but I can wear this in the heat. Um, and there's some oak moss and sandalwood. And the oak moss seems, you know, pretty amped up here. At least it feels that way. Uh, I don't know how old this bottle is. Actually, they actually stuck two stickers on the bottom of my bottle. I don't know if that's an issue with the factory or what, but I do really like this, and I think it deserves more 
I think it deserves more love. There's almost like this hinting at an old school fougere, but it's not a fougere, strangely enough, you know, I, and and uh, the spices also, you know, again, spices were a big thing in 1978, and both of these are, are spicy. I just think Derek is a better fragrance out and out. I think it's better composed. Uh, it seems higher quality. There's more transitions. There's hints of green here, that herbal coriander. The patchouli is very green and damp feeling, you know, like wet, like it just rained and it's all over the patchouli. Uh, but a beautiful perfume, very masculine. Actually, from here on out, every single thing in this list is masculine, heavy masculine. My kind of fragrances, heavy masculine until we get to the number one spot. So I don't want to take that with what you may. And I thought about how would I put the number one spot at anything other than what it ended up being, and I couldn't. I mean, it had to be number one. And just just beautiful creations all around, though. But these fragrances in between are just uber masculine. And so now that I say that, of course, the next two, I think, are probably the most uh, maybe unisex of the bunch that we're going to talk about that are geared towards the masculine side of things. This came out in 1976, and this is discontinued, unfortunately. Derek is still available to purchase, as is Homme de Café, but we're going to get to a bunch of discontinued fragrances here. So 1976, according to Parfumo, I think some say this came out in 1978, but either way it would fall within our list. This is a beautiful, um, almost like a take on a barbershop fougere, but with green touches, and it's called Halston 112. So Halston 112 is kind of the forgotten Halston. Everyone talks about Z14, which is higher up on this list. And Halston 112 is, um, I think the reason that Halston 112 never got the limelight or got the love that it deserves is that it's a very uh, green and floral type of uh, fougere. I think this is a classic fougere through and through. Uh, it has bergamot in the top, it has uh, lavender in the heart, and it has uh, tonka bean in the base. And so it has, and it has oak moss, of course, it has a lot of the uh, proper uh, fougere DNA ingredients, right? But it has this, um, these green touches that really, I mean, feel natural in this fragrance. And it's very floral. There's a jasmine and carnation combo here that I think maybe some of the guys that like to wear the uber masculine fragrances, this was maybe a little bit weird for them, you know, and it goes through these transitions and the way that this fragrance transitions are, it transitions in a way that seems like it really is intense during that stage of transition. So when you get that green galbanum and basil and pine, you're like, wow, this is a very green fragrance. But then you smell it an hour later and you're like, wow, this is a very floral fragrance. Then you smell it an hour later and you say, wow, this is a very barbershoppy type of fougere. And But what I mean is when it goes through those transitions, it really takes on that personality. That stage of the fragrance really kind of takes over. And so I think smelling this, probably people, some people probably got phases of it that put them off. You know, if you don't like floral fragrance fragrances, and you're a guy, and let's say you don't like jasmine or the carnation in here, it might put you off. Um, if if you don't like green fragrances, the way that the green basil and pine and galbanum kind of come together in the top may put you off. If you don't like lavender, sometimes that herbal classic barbershop fougere comes out here. Um, the dry down with the vanilla is beautiful, though. I will tell you that. And it's classically 70s, masculine with that musky, woody, you know, oak mossy dry down, but it's beautiful and so underrated. No one talks about this because this was like, again, a $20 perfume, uh, even in, even while it was being sold. People just completely overlooked it because it was, oh, it's a Halston. Uh, and people thought it was cheap because it was at TJ Maxx. It's not. It's beautiful. It deserves more love and it's discontinued. So if you want this, this is a hundred, um, so this is a 3.9 fluid ounce bottle, interestingly enough. 3.9. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, I've got a pretty good amount of juice. And you can see 
it's still relatively pretty full. This actually completely unscrews. This can be a splash or this can be a spray, but I'm very lucky to have this. Um, and if you can find the older bottles where the distributor actually says Halston Fragrances Inc. I don't know if you'll be able to see. Yeah, I think you will. Look at the second line from the bottom. See how it says Halston Fragrances Inc.? That is what you want most likely. There are some, um, there's some newer versions of this, which I have heard uh, were not really taken care of as well as they could have been, let's say. I don't know who the, um, I don't know who the final distributor was. I think it was probably EA, Elizabeth Arden, if memory serves. Um, but apparently this, uh, so ha Roy Halston Frowick, who founded Halston, uh, this was a big, big house hit in the, in the seventies. And so you think about disco going to the discotheque and dancing and stuff like that. And if you know Al Manzano, Hope you're doing well wherever you are, Al. He um, he basically said that, you know, this is what the nightclub smelled like. Halston Z14, and it was a huge hit back in the day. Halston 112, I'm sure, had its spot. Uh, there is a, there is a uh, beautiful, um, there's a beautiful biography or, you know, uh, that you can watch on, on, Roy, on Roy Halston Frowick. And I would urge you to check that out if you get a chance. I think you can find it on YouTube or maybe Netflix. I'm not 100% sure. He ended up dying in 1990 uh, from some sort of a immune disease. I don't know what it was. But um, um, he definitely lived the, the jet set life. He lived, uh, he, he lived the life. Uh, you know, he was, he was the star of the parties. His fragrances were huge hits. His, his designer house was really taken off in the 70s. Um, and I know that, um, if you remember those little, uh, those, those little hat pillbox hats that became popular in the sixties, I think Jacqueline Kennedy wore one to her husband's inauguration. That was how he kind of broke into the fashion world. Uh, he became very popular for his hats and he actually opened up his first store in Chicago at the age of 25 years old. So, you know, he was kind of a trendsetter. And uh, bravo to him. I love his brand. And I just, you know, wish more people would kind of uh, give it the limelight it deserves. Unfortunately for me, Halston 112 is coming in at uh, number 13. Number 12. And this is, again, a, a tough one to, uh, to rank because the fragrance itself is fantastic, gorgeous. Some say a masterpiece. Some people that I really trust say that this is their favorite Gucci fragrance of all time, ever. Like, rank all the Gucci's and this is the best one. Uh, I don't know if I would say that for myself, but I, if you like this style, uh, they classify this as like a woody, spicy fragrance. To me, I would put it in the same type of DNA. When I smell this, I think of things like, um, you know, if you know fragrances like... If you know fragrances like uh, Chanel's Pour Monsieur, the Eau de Toilette, if you know fragrances like Capucci Pour Homme, you know, these are the type of, of fragrances that are not my favorite, to be honest with you. I can appreciate them, but I don't like wearing them as much. And this kind of falls into that category, but I think this is much better done than uh, Pour Monsieur. It came out in 1976. And there were a couple other fragrances that I think really influenced this. So you could do something, you could talk about stuff like uh, YSL Pour Homme from 71 or Balenciaga Hohang from 71. I think those two really influenced this as well. But this is a creation by Guy Robert, believe it or not. Guy Robert made this and uh, he's he is uh, a perfumer who, Eura Rose, who I really trust, recently titled uh, one of his fragrances we were talking about. I think it was Amouage Gold. He called it the impossible fragrance. Like, it shouldn't work, but it just does. And I think people that don't understand perfume, they listen to the threads online, they read the rubbish written on Fragrantica, 
and they're like, oh, gold is a disgusting old lady perfume. They don't give it a chance and they don't understand the historical context of it. And they don't understand what a brilliant perfumer Guy Robert is. You know, he made equipage about six years prior to, to this. Um, I think I prefer this to equipage, believe it or not. But this is kind of this woody, spicy, classic take with lavender and citruses. There's that green basil note. And there's a combination, again, of spices, which sound will sound very familiar if you've been listening to other fragrances from this era. So you've got jasmine, sandalwood, spices, carnation, cedar, geranium, iris, patchouli, pepper. Labdanum, oak moss, vanilla, amber, leather, musk, and tonka bean. And I think it's that leathery dry down with this extremely posh iris. The iris here pops to me. It really does. And so it turns into this, yes, it's citrusy. Um, yes, it's herbal lavender. Yes, it has some, you know, link to the past, if you will. Guy Robert was huge about fragrances from the past. He was obsessed with L'Enfant Arpege, for example. And, you know, it does have some links to the past, but I like the way that this actually wears on my skin much better than something like Chanel Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette uh, and, or Dior uh, Eau Sauvage, the Eau de Toilette, or something like that, right? This is uh, much more interesting to me. The bottles were beautiful. This one doesn't do it justice because it's just a little 30 mil, but if you get one of the 50 or 100 mils, it almost has this Gucci... It looks like a belt buckle, so there's like a piece of fabric. This doesn't have it again because it's just the the um, the 30 mil. But if you go for the 50 or the 100 mil, and you can see the Gucci logo right there, um, yeah. If you go for the 50 or 100 mil, it almost has this fabric, and it looks like a man's belt buckle right there in the middle. It's a stunning bottle. I wish I had a bigger bottle, but they are expensive, and I got a very good deal on this 30 mil. So sometimes you have to sacrifice kind of uh, exactly what you want for the juice. And I'm glad to have this juice. I'm glad to be able to, you know, explore it and stuff like that. And it kind of has, if you know how Balenciaga's Ho Hang, not Ho Hang Club from 87, but Ho Hang from 71 has this, you know, labdanum kind of resinous leathery base. This has some of that in it. And I really like that about it. So Gucci Pour on One, a classic from 1976. The original Gucci Pour Homme One, not the Gucci Pour Homme One that Michelle Almarac made from 2003. Uh, beautiful fragrance, long discontinued, but it is in that classic style, and that's why I just can't put it any higher. Okay, we're getting to some huge hitters in my collection, like literally some of my all-time favorites. How I actually decided to rank this was a topic of much contention in my head for a while now. But I, I've settled on I've settled on something that I feel comfortable with. And number uh, eleven, if you know my taste, you're going to be shocked that this is here because uh, this could be number one. I mean, honestly, it could be. It could be number one on any vintage hunters list. This is a very rare, very hard to find fragrance from the house of Etienne Eigner, and it's called Super Fragrance for Men. Now, this is one. I have two of these little fifteen mils. You can see the short ingredient list right now. And um, so I, um, I mean, I wish I had more juice than what I have. You can see I've got a couple drops left in this one. I have a 15 mil backup. And I will do a video on this before all is said and done. Um, but this fragrance is kind of one of those Fragrances that was a little bit of a trendsetter. It is animalic, it's spicy, it's kind of challenging, okay? So it opens up with tarragon, bergamot, clary sage, galbanum, and lemon. And there's something... Oh, I got some on my hands. Oh, snap. I did not mean to get some on my hands. But we'll take this advantage to talk about it. So there's something... Oh, sh... Kind of, like, leaked for real. Oh, wow. Hang on. Yeah, so there's something very 70s musky about it, and that's why I hate, I really hate these bottles. I wish I would have got a bigger one with a spray than these two splashes, but hey, again, you got to kind of take what you can get, and you can see the Eigner logo right there on the front. On the back, there's a sticker some perfumery put on there from Hanover. Uh, interestingly enough, because Eigner is a German brand, I believe. So it's Tarragon. And immediately you get hit with this um, anisic-like 
you know, musky smell with galbanum, the resinous galbanum. But you're also hit with patchouli. There's a big patchouli in here. Uh, but you know how the patchouli and Balenciaga Porom kind of blends in a very unique style with the fragrance. It's almost like a patchouli like you've never smelled because of how it all comes together with, with the spices. And there's a little bit of that here. But what really sets this apart is there's this Costas note in the base. And Costas um, is an oil that basically gives off this animalic note. Um, it can seem very warm, woody, earthy, and musky. And that's exactly how I would describe this. And they say that Costas has the smell of um, fur or like human hair. But I always think of it as like unwashed human hair. And Costas and Costas root both kind of fall into this category, if you will. This is Costas oil. So while other fragrances that come in the 70s and that will come in the 80s, are going to use a lot of castorium and a lot of um, uh, civet and, and hyrax and stuff like that. This is almost like a, think of it like a 70s precursor to Amouage Opus 7, uh, which is called, um, Amouage Opus 7 is called, oh no, they named it. Hang on, let me see if I can find it. I always forget these dumb names that they do. Opus 7, uh, Reckless Leather. They named it Reckless Leather. And it has a little bit of, like, almost imagine if you took Eigner Super Fragrance for Men and made it into an amouage and you added that incense and um, made it niche quality, right? Because this is a 70s fragrance. This came out in 1970, what did I say? 1970... Um, Eight. This came out in 1978. I don't know who the perfumer is, but what a beautiful... And you know what's so beautiful about uh, Super Fragrance for Men to me? What really just makes me think that this is uh, something that I need to get a full bottle of, like a 100 mil bottle, like a proper bottle, is the way that the uh, animalics kind of end up blending with the poshness of the iris and the woody notes and the ambery. There's like this ambery warmth of a dry down. And Jonathan 1970, who I need to have him back on the channel for a live stream one of these days, he um, said that he thinks that this fragrance was one of the biggest inspirations for other fragrances in the future. And I agree with him. I know exactly what he means. But the poshness and the way that I feel like I could wear this, like, I feel like I could wear this to important business meetings. Like, there's some 70s and 80s fragrances you wouldn't wear to a meeting with, uh, a, you know, an important boss in your company or something like that, just because of the animalic nature of it, right? Wearing Portos or uh, Koros or something like that might give off a bad vibe. This has the same Eigner poshness that I mentioned when I talked about Eigner Silver, which you will see when we get to the 80s. But this has a little bit of that Balenciaga Portos, but it also has this posh, kind of easier to wear character to it. And I feel that way about Super Fragrance. Um, yes, it's animalic, it's resinous, it's ambery, it's warm. It's, it's kind of challenging, even for me, because this is something very different than what I'm used to smelling. There is some vanilla and tonka, but the focus is on that sharp, musky, animalic, you know, contrasted with woody, green, um, anisic, galbanum, tarragon, that kind of thing. But the woods are there, but there's this unbelievably posh iris. Uh, and, and somebody recently said that uh, a fragrance uh, that I tested recently, one of the creators of that fragrance said when he smells iris that it reminds him of like smelling a newborn baby's head. And I've never thought about that before, but it's a great descriptor of iris. There's this calming, you know, powdery poshness to iris. It rounds everything out. It makes everything feel 3D. This fragrance feels like you can just walk right into it. You can walk right into it, the fourth dimension almost. Uh, it's, it's beautiful and it's very, very hard to find is the only downside about it. If you can, 
If you can get your nose on this and you're a lover of classic perfumes, this deserves much more love in the community. And I will do a full review on Eigenair uh, Super Fragrance for men before uh, I use up all my precious juice. I'm going to turn the light on because it's starting to get dark and the window is not doing it justice. And you guys need to see this because this is an important video. So, um, let's go on to the top 10. So... Uh, again, struggles all around on where to put these because of just how much I love all of them. Ultimately, I ended up putting this at number 10. This was as high as number 8, but it ended up coming down a little bit once I did some reshuffling. Uh, and it is one of my favorite Van Cleef and Arpels creations. Uh, there's only two that I really, really love. I also like um, Midnight in Paris, but I don't love it like I do Sar and like I do... Van Cleef and Arpels, Pour Homme. Let me give this a little wipe so you don't see the fingerprints here. So I brought out both bottles because that's how important this video seems to me. And I want to show you guys both versions. So I actually have uh, a couple versions of this. So this version right here is whoever created this before Interparfums. Interparfums was the last creator of Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme, and I think they discontinued it, you know, five or seven years ago, somewhere around there. I can't remember exactly when, but um, let me show you the two versions. So this came out in 1978. This is one of my favorite masculine rose fragrances of all time. And again, that's why I said this is so hard to rank because, again, this could be number one uh, on anyone's list. It is such a beautiful masculine rose. If I had to do vintage masculine rose fragrances and just pick three, this would be one of them. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And if you look at the newer bottle right there, you can see how the Pour Homme is actually written inside of the top and the Eau de Toilette's on the bottom. And you can see there's a sticker on the bottom, right? Uh, and if you look at the older bottle, this is actually a vintage bottle. Uh, this is a deep vintage. This is uh, before... Um, before they put the sticker on the bottom, and you can see it's just kind of the actual writing. It says 50 mil, 1.7 fluid ounce, and that's it. No sticker on the bottom. And you can see that the Eau de Toilette is not down here. It's actually inside of the, um, you can see it's inside of the uh, little raised piece of glass right here. And you notice that the older deep vintage does not say poor ohm. See how it doesn't say poor ohm? There's no need to say poor ohm. It's just Van Cleef and Arpels. Everyone knows it's poor ohm. Uh, they added the poor ohm later on. Um, and Van Cleef and Arpels actually got their start as jewelry makers. That's what they did. They were jewelry makers, the, the, the pair of them. I think they were just friends, Van Cleef and Arpels. I don't think they were, um, you know, family or anything like that. And, um, oh, and you can see that this one actually says Van Cleef and Arpels Paris in, in the middle where this one doesn't. Uh, and I don't know if you'll be able to see just a little different style on the sprayers. Um, but there you have it. Uh, my two Van Cleef and Arpels, my 100 mil, my 50 mil. I am in love with this fragrance. It's a spicy leathery Sheepra is basically what it is with a huge rose note. That just is deep and brooding, and it just fits so beautifully into this Sheepra structure. So uh, it's smoky, it's green, it's rosy, it's dark, it's uh, leathery. You know, there's resinous labdanum in the dry down. There's a little bit of frankincense, which gives off the smokiness, and there's leather in the base. And the leather, I've always said that the leather in Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme is made using the same kind of leather construction that I have just completely fallen head over heels in love with. Leather fragrances from the 1970s and 80s really feel like the castorium note, which gives off this leathery profile. Castorium, of course, comes from inside of the gut of the beaver. It's a gland, uh, and it gives off this, to me, very warm, almost metallic uh, zing, like a like a twang, you know, but like a twang, you ever put like a copper penny in your mouth and it leaves that 
in the back of your throat, right? And it hits you right here and you're like, oh, you know, or, or you know, when you were a kid, you'd put kind of a, a copper penny under your tongue or something and it would like make make the sides of your face kind of like hurt, you know? Uh, that's, that's kind of the way that castorium sometimes will just kind of just hit you. And here you get some of that. It's, um, it, <laughs> Oh man, I can smell it just from the from the from the atomizer. And um but there's also a little bit of just classic, you know, this is the first Van Cleef and Arpels masculine fragrance for men because before this they were jewelry makers, right? So this is kind of their intro to the luxury fragrance aisle from from 1978. Uh, and you can see the, so the house was founded in the 1800s, 1896 to be exact. And Solomon Arpels and their son in, and his son-in-law. Okay, so they were kind of married by, through or married. They were family through marriage. Son-in-law, Alfred Van Cleef. They were extraordinary jewel and watchmakers. And look at the bottle. I mean, it almost looks like a, yes, it's a simple design. I love the built-in sprayers of the old days. Like, this comes off if you pull this hard enough. This will just, oh, there you go. That's what it looks like. Um, but add this little top back on. Look how classy that built-in sprayer looks. I think it looks beautiful, stunning. I've scratched it up a little bit, kind of moving it all over. But um, yes, I mean, they made uh, uh, jewelry for you know, royalty from Egypt to, I mean, they're world-renowned fame, basically, right? And so they decided to get into the fragrance game, and this was their start of uh, fragrances for men. Uh, and it comes off, uh, when you first spray, it comes off smelling like a lot of things hit you at once. This is a very complex fragrance, but it's basically a sheep red heart. And I would call this a powerhouse. I mean, when people refer to the 70s and 80s powerhouse fragrances, this is a great example of that. But the difference is, even though it's a powerhouse, it has this, you know, traditional masculine, like lavender, spicy, green. There's artemisia in here. Uh, so you get that deep green. There's a little bit of clove. There's patchouli. So it's it, this is a very heavy fragrance. Some people would say this is probably a winter fragrance only. And I could see why they would say that, although I wear my fragrances whenever I want. And that's really been very, very freeing for me. And you would be surprised how amazing fragrances like this smell when it gets warmer. So there's cedarwood, there's vetiver, there is that. The rose is kind of the star of the show, though. So you imagine you're smelling a rose dominant. Um, the mid, the rose really takes over. But I love how the kind of interplays in the fragrance come together. So you get those spicy, fresher aspects when you first spray, the spices of the nutmeg, the freshness of kind of the juniper with the bergamot and the, the lavender, and then it goes down into the deeper, darker, you know, look at the color. Look at the color of the bottle they decided to choose. This pure tuxedo black, you know, just elegant, uh, pulling up in a, you know, uh, entourage of just black SUVs and your driver opens the door for you and you get out. I mean, that's what I imagine. You're wearing a James Bond tuxedo. It's that vibe. Uh, obviously, you could wear your fragrances whenever, wherever you want. I wear this to the grocery store. I don't care. Uh, but it's that musky, again, musky dry down, but with leather. And the, the interplay between the castorium and the leather is mind-blowing in Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme. So that's number 10. Number nine. Uh, number nine is um, Halston Z14. This barely beat out Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme. And some people may be shocked that it did because this is still seen as a cheapie. But uh, this fragrance has so much history to it. I pulled out both of my bottles and um, Halston Z14 is, to me, I think kind of this prototypical um, spicy, the note here that I think is the brilliant note outside of the spices, because spices are kind of the key to me, is, um, the cypress. I wish more favorite fragrances use the note of cypress. This actually, I think, inspired Tom Ford's Italian cypress, if memory serves. I know Tom Ford has tried to recreate this fragrance, like, many times, because this was his signature scent when he was a young man, 
and um, it's spicy, it's woody, it's got patchouli, and it also has this leathery, mossy, ambery type dry down. Um, and I have two bottles here. So if you take a look at the first bottle I had, and both of these I think are Halston, uh, I think these are both Halston Fragrances Inc. Yeah, this one's Halston Fragrances Inc. But look where it is made. So it's made in New York, New York, right? That makes sense because Halston's, uh, he is a um, USA designer. But look at this bottle of Halston Z14. This is a splash that I got. And the guy kind of, I've scratched it up again, just being in my collection, stuff dropping on it or whatever it is. But uh, the juice is still perfect. And look at the bottle. Look at the bottom of this one. Z14, Eau de Toilette, made in France. I have never seen a made in France bottle outside of this. Um, but then again, I haven't been looking so hard. But Parfums Halston is what this one says. Um, Parfums Halston instead of Halston Fragrances Inc. And it's made in France. So. Uh, one of these days, if I get bored, I'll do a comparison video, but this, um, oh, it's, it's so good. And it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me a little bit of Clive Christian's X for Men. Clive Christian's X for Men always reminded me of like this Z14 DNA, but niched up, put into a niche bottle. Kind of like I say, Roja, Roja's fragrances up, Clive Christian, Clive Christian them up. And um, that's what it feels like to me. This is a classic. Came out in 1976, if memory serves. The cinnamon in here is... Uh, I know I said Cypress is the star of the show. I think it's the most unique note, the Cypress. But the cinnamon, to me, is kind of uh, the most perceptible note. You will definitely get that uh, cinnamon, ambery, and... Um, You've smelled this before. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The cypress just adds this, you know, almost like this evergreen, almost like this Christmas tree green, herbaceous, woody, spicy scent on top. And it's, it's to me, it's very unique. And it is not cheap at all. The people who think this is cheap, I just think they don't know what they're talking about. It's just because they associate it with cheap because it was $12 a bottle or $15 a bottle at Marshall's. And those days are gone because it's officially discontinued as well. So you won't be seeing this. And this was purchased by or created by Vincent Marcello and Max Gavari. And Max did a couple other things that are pretty good as well. So, uh, so yeah, Halston Z14, if you're a fan of the fragrances that I love, put that on the list for sure. Number uh, eight. That was number nine. Number eight is a Keron. And again, I pulled out both bottles just, just to show you. Uh, I have a deep vintage and kind of a, still a vintage bottle, but a newer one. And this is called Yatagan. So the the, vin, the deeper vintage has this kind of older Caron logo on the front, if you will. But both bottles are stunning. You know, I uh, I think even the new Yatagan is okay. If you can find a vintage, I would, as usual, encourage you to do it. But um, I love... Uh, Yatagan in any form that I've smelled. It's basically a 1976 release. This also came out from Vincent, Vincent Marcello. So you will, he was a hit. He was a star perfumer back in the 70s. Uh, and this is known for its leathery castorium in the dry down. And castorium is one of my favorite notes of all time. Uh, but imagine that you're kind of putting that castorium note along with this earthy forest floor-like smell. So the way I describe Yatagan, and this is true for either bottle that I've smelled, is that imagine that you are walking in the woods and you're smelling the greenness from the shrubs and the trees and the plants all around you. Uh, and of course it has that very sharp 70s masculine touch that you just don't get and except for fragrances from these, you know, the decade of the 70s and 80s, that green, anisic-like tarragon mixed with pine, okay? And that's a big part of it, the pine. The green pine with old-school spicy carnation, geranium, patchouli, uh, vetiver. Vetiver gives it this uh, very earthy, you know, 
almost like you're sm you're smelling the plant, but you're smelling the plant underground, right? You're smelling the roots of the pl plant. That's what kind of vetiver gives you. That's the feel of vetiver. But the star of the show, again, is this um, oak moss and castorium. And um, the animalic leathery castorium in this just makes the fragrance. I mean, it's, uh, it is, Yatigan is actually like a saber. It's a, it's a, it's a sword, a saber, a specific type of sword. Uh, and I think you can see from the way that the Yatigan name is written, look at the T in Yatigan. You see how it almost looks like a say, that's what a Yatagan looks like right there, the T in, in Yatagan. Um, and so the newer bottles are kind of in this style, but this is white. This is not red. So this is a previous version. Caron has been through so many iterations is the problem, but this spicy, woody, animalic, totally masculine, one of the most hardcore masculine scents you'll ever smell. It has that 70s brown, you know, look at the color of the juice. And it has that 70s brown feel to it, right? Um, this is an older tester that I got from uh, Anuj. And this is, oh, one of these days, maybe I'll do a comparison video. I don't think there's much to compare because they're both amazing. But for spicy, woody, animalic, leathery, you know, if you want to smell kind of like the old school animalic masculines in the day and you've got your list made out and you have Koros and you have Antaeus and you have all that stuff, this is one to put on the list. This is on that list of animalic masculines from the past that, uh, that I love, that are near and dear to my heart. And while we're on the subject, I'll just show you, there's a fragrance that I stumbled across that to me, um, I think it came out a couple years after. Let me just look it up real quick. I think it came out a couple years after Yatagan, but they share a very similar... It did. Yeah, it came out in 1979. So this will be on the next video. But these two, this is uh, Punjab by the House of uh, Capucci. And these two are, you know, kissing cousins. They are right there. They're very close to each other. But um, if you like one, you'll like the other. This definitely took its cues from from Yatagan. Um, and so, so yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get to, we will get to Punjab next time on the next this year in perfume, but Yatagan comes in at number eight, number seven. And again, I mean, the hits just keep coming here. So this is uh, Lagerfeld Cologne. I'm going to call it Lagerfeld Cologne. It ended up being Lagerfeld Classic but originally it was Lagerfeld Cologne. I got the uh, box and bottle of one of my vintage to show you. See how it said Lagerfeld Cologne there? And the newer ones say classic. I can definitely smell a difference between these two, 100%, big difference. Go for the one that says Cologne. Don't worry so much whether it's a, like this is a Bethco or Parfums International or Lagerfeld Fragrances or whatever. Don't worry about any of that. If it says Lagerfeld Cologne, you're good. I mean, you're getting one of the vintage uh, bottles that, to me, just had more of that tobacco masculine oak moss. It really feels like a vintage masculine fragrance to me, whereas the new one, it still has the DNA is intact, if you will, okay? You can definitely tell it's Lagerfeld uh, Cologne, but, and you can see how the script there is a little bit different on the vintage versus the modern, whoops, I'll show you guys the right side, versus the modern, see how the script is different between the two? So this is the vintage that I would say to try to hunt down. Don't worry about the version, just get the one that says Lagerfeld Cologne like this. So the difference is, is that the new one kind of keeps this ambery, um, it keeps this, uh, so the way that the, kind of ambery, aldehydic. There's a very, the color of the juice is a great representer of this fragrance. And you see how this juice almost looks darker. See how it looks almost murkier and darker? That's a perfect representation of the difference of the smell. Doesn't always work out that way, but in this case it does. See how this looks almost like food coloring orange? Uh, and that's kind of what it feels like. You get more of the, um, you get more of the ambery, orangey notes 
right? It's a little sweeter. It's a little bit more tonka, feels like a little more ambery, uh, much less tobacco, much less oak moss, much less of that feeling that gives it that masculine 70s fragrance, right? Uh, this is from 1978, Lagerfeld Cologne, which ended up turning into Lagerfeld Classic, and now both are discontinued. I would say any version you can get is fine. If you like the vintage masculines like I do, if you like the animalics, go for the one that says cologne. But if you actually prefer the ambery, you know, if you prefer prefer wearing things like Grand Soir, right? That's your idea of a fantastic ambery fragrance, easy to wear. The 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 one that actually says classic is, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful value for money. I think I got this 150 mil bottle. Yeah, 150 mils from Inter Parfums with a body wash for like 20 bucks. Uh, now, I don't, this was years ago, so I don't know what they are now, but uh, I love this stuff in, in the cold. I love it all together, but in the cold, it really is beautiful. Mmm, um, so good. That ambery, and there is this powdery orange thing that kind of runs through the perfume. So, you know, if, if there's this almost like this powdery orris root vibe that you end up getting from the fragrance. And I will give you another couple hints or just side notes. If that's your thing, like if you smell that and you're like, holy moly, I am in love with that. Um, I feel like it was the fragrance that then uh, influenced Lagerfeld to do KL for women in 1982. And I feel like it was kind of the grandfather that kicked off this 80s trend of kind of musky, orangey fragrances. And this made, uh, you know, this entered the scene in the 80s a decade later. But I feel like Lagerfeld Classic or Lagerfeld Cologne is like the father, you know, uh, or even the grandfather, you could say, of uh, obsession for women or for men, you know. Uh, I think this really kind of set the stage for these types of fragrances in the 80s. But um, but yes, I, I absolutely love Lagerfeld Classic it, it and Cologne, either, either version. But it hurt my soul to put it at number seven. But again, all of these are amazing. But I had to because you're going to see some even bigger hitters coming up. Next, at number six, we have an Azaro. And you know which one it is. I mean, uh, the best... Azaro fragrance ever made. Probably, if you looked me in the eye and said the best barbershop fragrance ever made, and you didn't blink and you were dead serious, I would give you mad respect because it's true. I mean, it, I think it's probably the best, one of the best barbershop fragrances ever made. Uh, it is the great Azaro Pour Homme. Again, if you can get the one that has the sticker on the front, do it. The newer bottles of this basically look like this. So the front has the Azaro A like this. See how it's like in the bottle? Like it's um, uh, part of the bottle, it's not a sticker. That's what the new bottles of Azaro Pour Homme look like. This is the intense version. Um, and the vintage ones look like this with a sticker. And so that's what you want. Doesn't Don't worry about much else. You can really, if you really want to get deep into it, you can, and, and you'll find that, you know, there are other tells as to which you know, some say Laura Cesaro, some don't. I mean, it's just you can really get into the weeds with it. Simplicity, get the one with the sticker, you're in good. Um, probably just, you know, if you had like 40 bucks to spend and you want to smell fantastic and you're a fan of barbershop fougeres, oh, and this really popularized the note that this popularized in men's fragrances, and you've seen it before. But I feel like it really took off here is the anise. The anise in the opening um, mixed with that barbershop fougere style. And this is a Gerard Anthony. There's other perfumers that claim to have worked on it. Uh, Luca Turin says there's no less than 20 perfumers who take credit for Azaro Poron. I'm going to give the credit to Gerard Anthony because he's one of my favorite perfumers of all time. He did uh, Balenciaga Poron and... Um, you know, a bunch of, we, I did a, 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 a Gerard Anthony perfumers portfolio video. I will rank it very soon. Uh, so I will rank his video, but, um, it, it, it's just, 
the perfect barbershop scent to me. And it has all of these facets, you know, again, spicy and woody. The lavender is posh and herbal. The basil is green. The juniper adds the freshness to it. Um, the cardamom is spicy and the woods are just beautifully executed. Uh, and you can see I have a splash here. So, um, I mean, if, if I usually don't splash my fragrances, it has a nice stopper. If I had to splash one though, this would be the one to splash on. After a nice shave, oh, I mean, this is James Bond level smooth to me. And it dries down to that oak moss tonka that you expect from a classic uh, barbershop, fougere. Very masculine. There's a little bit of a leathery touch in the base too. And look at the color scheme. Again, this 70s brown that you just see over and over and over in all of the packaging. I mean, look at this. Uh, look at the Halston brown packaging. Look at this super fragrance. Just this brown 70s packaging. You just see it over and over and over and you see it here too. But it just works. It's just, I love how um, straightforward and, you know, they that they were back in the day. Not just with the fragrances, even with the packaging. There's no bling bling. There's no Swarovski's crystals all over the cap. You know, you're not paying the, the brand an extra $100 for a box that magnetically closes. It's just a beautifully designed, perfect, Again, Pierre Denard made this bottle, probably the, the uh, goat of bottle creators. And it's just so utilitarian. Uh, it, it conveys the point exactly like it should. No screwing around. And uh, I love everything about, about Azaro Porom. So uh, next on the list, we have number five. Number five is... Uh, I mean, just having to put this at number five, again, hurts my soul because I think it's one of the greatest masculine fragrances ever created. And uh, this is the great Polo Green. And I have two versions here. So this is actually the original Warner version. So if you look right, whoops. Yeah, so if you look right here, you will see that it says Warner slash Lauren limited right there in the middle cologne spray wasn't an edt yet it's a cologne spray um <clears throat> and i actually think this is my favorite version so if you twisted my arm i'd tell you sure go for warner however i'm not going to tell you that because it's very hard to come by and extremely expensive most people who have the warner bottles know what they have and they just jack the prices up what i will tell you to do is to try to get either a warner or a Cosmere, if you can. Um, the newer ones, someone told me that the newer ones have kind of made a little bit of a comeback. I don't know. Um, I would stick with the Cosmere or the Warner bottles if you, if you have the opportunity to. Oh, God. You know what? I, I almost feel bad putting this here but i had to it just i couldn't put it any higher because we are going into some serious loves um but this is uh juniper basil bergamot caraway coriander and tarragon again tarragon is my secret ingredient note with uh pine this is a pine this is probably my favorite pine fragrance it just captures the pine note perfectly um with carnation pepper chamomile geranium Leather, jasmine, rose, oak moss, tobacco, amber, cedar, musk, patchouli, and vetiver. And it's that leather, tobacco, pine combination that just does it for me. This smells like, if if you just say, Ramsey, pick one fragrance that is a reference fragrance for what a man should smell like, in my mind, okay, being 37 years old. Because when I went to barbecues, when I was a kid in the 90s or whatever it is, most of the men back then, they weren't wearing, you know, the aquatics of the day. Uh, that was usually for the younger kids. They were wearing stuff like this or 80 stuff, you know. Uh, this is what I smelled on my barber and on neighbors and uncles and, you know, friends of my father, work people that, you know, worked with my old man or whatever it is. They came over to the house. This is what I smelled on them. Stuff like this. And this, that's what I associate with masculinity. Not the modern, disgusting, sweet, vanilla, 
praline, you know, uh, just disgusting sweetness that they put in men's fragrances. Now, those aren't masculine fragrances to me. All fragrances are unisex, but when I think of traditional masculine perfumery, this is like the gold standard for me, and I absolutely love it. I have three bottles of this stuff. The leather and the greenness and the, you know, tobacco, the, the, uh, man, and I'm a sucker for leather and tobacco, and here it's done with the pine just so beautifully. It's a Carlos Benayim. I still think it's his best creation, but Carlos Benayim has some hits. I mean, what a comeback he had, and this actually came from the, this one came from the Great Anuj. You can see it's Cosmere Canada, so this was in Anuj's warehouse for a while. Shout out to Bry for get, getting this to me. Um, uh, just the way the spices and the greenness mix with the, um, mix with the leather and the tobacco is enchanting to me. I, I absolutely love it. Best polo fragrance, hands down. Second best, uh, would probably have to be polo, um, safari for men. And then I would say polo crest. And then you could go something like polo sport, uh, the original Cosmere, but Man, Polo from 1978 is just, I mean, it's almost like masculinity. Just, I, I, I could wear the, I could wear these type of fragrances all day, every day. But in a ranked list, something has to be higher and something has to be lower and higher. At number four, we have Dunhill Blend 30. And my God, man, I mean, you know, fragrances like uh, this DNA get hyped and even something like Polo, Maybe tough to wear daily because it's so, uh, you know, it, when I say it's a statement maker, it is a statement maker. I mean, you are going to stand out wearing stuff like uh, Polo, Yatagan, um, even the vintage bottles of Z14 are just a beast. Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Home, forget about it. You won't get that off for days. Uh, you know, these, these fragrances, that one or two sprays and you are flying for hours and this one, it still has that masculine edge, but it's a little bit more refined, I would say. I would put this more in the category of, you know, Patu Pour Homme, or oh, just look at this bottle. This is a 250 mil piece of glory. And I mean, oh God, my God, man. Oh, so Dunhill, if you guys know anything about Dunhill's past, um, Dunhill was basically a company um, that was known for, uh, originally, I think they were a company that was kind of this saddle maker, okay? So they made saddlery and stuff like that. In the late 1800s, that was a very stable type of company. Uh, because people thought horses were going to be around forever, right? But they decided to expand, and they started to do leather covers for, like, automobiles and stuff like that. And they created this, um, um, they created this expansion in the company where they expanded to stuff like tobaccos. And with that came the legendary Dunhill pocket lighter that became kind of, uh, one of the best sellers for the brand in 1927. In 1930, they finally switched, in the 1930s, they finally switched to perfumes. And with Dunhill for Men from 1934, they came out with their first fragrance. So Dunhill goes way back. They're, they're, they're a very old company with a big history. And um, this one for me, though, is the best Dunhill I've, I've ever smelled, hands down. Uh, this is the best from the house. And there's some good ones, but this is the best. And I'm so glad to have a 250 mil of this. Basically, it's a fragrance that kind of touches on the Dunhill history to me because you get some of this um, tobacco in the dry down, but it actually smells like crispy, like almost like you're smelling hay. So imagine um, you have this hay-like note, which there's been hay notes put in uh, fragrances uh, it's a, it's a note that you can kind of perceive in fragrances like um, Fougere Bengal by uh, Parfum d'Empire. There's a beautiful hay note in Tobacco Rose. Uh, and 
If you know Tobacco Rose, imagine calling a fragrance Tobacco Rose with no tobacco. What Liz Moore's put into Papillon's Tobacco Rose is this hay, like no, hay and tobacco share a lot of similarities when you smell them. And there's this beautiful hay, uh, but it's kind of like um, a very classic fragrance. You know how Paco Rabanne Pour Homme comes off as a very classic type of uh, fougere for the company? This is Dunhill Blend 30. This is Dunhill's like classic fragrance. You get very posh lavender, beautiful rosemary that probably hints a little bit to Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, but you get this uh, beautiful woody, spicy, uh, touches of green, touches of smoke. The labdanum, oh man, the, the way that the spices blend, my God, I mean, if you told me that this is your favorite fragrance of all time, again, I wouldn't bat an eye. I would not bat an eye at that statement. I would say, well, well done. You have fantastic taste, sir. Um, or madam, because, you know, this is uh, discontinued, obviously, and hard to find, but anyone could wear this. This is a, and it's a year-round fragrance. It, it has all of the features I love. Like, it has that tobacco, like, you know, fall. This fragrance reminds me of fall. It has this outdoor feeling. The leaves are turning. You know, maybe you pull out your nice coat for the very first time, right? It's been away all summer. Take it out for the very first time. You go for a crisp walk. Uh, that's the feeling of Blend 30 for me. But it's very classic. There's ambergris in the base. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's real ambergris. I mean, it feels, everything feels of the highest quality in here. Very posh. Very, um, you know, very elegant. Somebody who really has their stuff together. I know I've said that with other fragrances. A man who pays the bills. A man that is on time. That they're, you know, um, if they say they're going to do something, they do it. That They're true to their word. That's somehow this fragrance gives me the same impression I get when I say those type of things about boss number one. Hugo boss number one. Or There's just this traditional, you know, bit of masculinity. This wisdom. To the, there's this wisdom to this fragrance and really just soaking in every every moment you know when you go for that walk and the leaves are turning you're you're enjoying every moment with your family because you know how precious they are right that's the feeling dunhill blend 30 gives me and just look at the bottle i mean i don't know why but something about this is just like an absolute work of art i mean trying to show you the sticker without like flipping it over and losing any juice. Um, but yes, I mean, it is just, to me, it's just a work of art. I mean, this is, uh, this is just classic men's perfumery done at the absolute highest level. I don't know who the perfumer is, but whoever they are, bravo. And I mean, if you like stuff like this, you'll probably like Patu Pour Homme. You'll probably like, um, since I gave you a, couple options for something to compare to, like Yatagan or Lagerfeld. I'll say if you like this, you could go try to hunt down this. Charles Jordan, uh, Un Om. These two share some similarities. And, you know, this will come up in our 80s video at some point. But, man, I mean, what can I say? Dunhill Blend 30 is one of the few fragrances that has the pleasure, the privilege of living in its box. Most fragrances don't get to live in its box at, at Channel Ram. Um, Dunhill Blend 30 lives in his box, and um, I'm very glad to have him. So, that was number four. Number three uh, is my scent of the day. I want to reapply because I want to show you this atomizer. Watch this atomizer. By the way, this is Ted Lapidus um, Pour Homme from 1978. And the reason this is here... Look at this. See that? It just, I mean, almost like a pressurized atomizer, but it's a perfect little stream. Look at this. Oh, it's so good too. I wish you guys, I wish you guys could smell these along with me. Mmm. It is, uh, the reason this is here is really more for personal taste, I have to say. One of the biggest regrets, and it comes in this beautiful set, Look how they used to do these sets, these collector's sets back in the day. I mean, with the and this pen still works, even though it's from the 
late 70s. This pen still works. Um, and it comes in this beautiful set. And so the reason that this is number three for me, any of these could have been here. Polo Green could have been here. Blend 30 could have been here. Lagerfeld, Azaro, Yadigan, Z14. They all could have been at number three. Okay, easily. And But the reason this ended up making number three is because of the leather. Oh, and you guys know I'm a sucker for a couple things. Castorium and leather. And this does it at such a high level. It's got herbs. It, it opens up kind of aldehydic and, and you get this thyme. And, you know, uh, whereas Polo Green does pine to perfection, Ted Lapidus Porum does leather, castorium, and spruce, and vetiver, and patchouli and clove. And so you get the idea, spicy, leathery, but the leather is very prominent here. And that's why this ended up making number three. That's why it barely beat Dunhill Blend 30, uh, is the leathery aspect of Ted Lapidus Porum from 1978, for my taste, personally, is a huge winner. And one of my biggest regrets is Rich Mitch was selling a 50 mil bottle of this. And when I had my haul come over from him, uh, that the long lost haul is the video. If you go look up my haul videos and he sent me stuff like, um, Kinski by Kinski, which, you know, that is what prompted the haul. He sent me stuff like this, Shalimar. I bought this off of him. I bought a backup of jazz. Um, and, but one of the things that I said no to, which I'm really kicking myself now is he had a 50 mil of Ted Lapidus pour home. And um, I only have a 30 mil and I should have bought it. That was a huge mistake on my part because the way, oh God, I mean, the way, the way that the leather just kind of takes control of this perfume is exactly how I like my leather fragrances to be. And there's a little bit of smoke. It's earthy, it's spicy, it's woody, it's completely masculine, and it is totally devoid of sweetness. Almost like they just took a vacuum and sucked out every ounce of sweetness here. It is so 70s. And I mean, look at the color. Um, look at the bottle. You know, look how just 70s that looks. There's the sprayer. There's the little trigger. You saw how it sprays. Um, you know, there's the bottom. Made in Italy. Uh, it is, it, I mean... What a mistake I made not getting that back up to, to back this up because I'm going to feel a serious loss when this is gone. And the Castorium, the Animalics, oh I mean, the Castorium in a lot of the fragrances that we've talked about, like uh, Yatagan is very well done. The, the Castorium in Yatagan is like legendary among people who collect vintage fragrances. But to me, this is superior. I like the way that the leather interplays with the castorium and this resinous labdanum. Of course, loads of oak moss. It has that 70s muskiness I've been talking about, but it also opens up very herbal, you know, green, uh, herbal, um, almost sticky coriander, almost sticky. The fragrance has almost like this sticky feel to it, like like uh, you touch sap or honey, but there is no, it's spruce is, is what it is. Uh, and spruce is actually another note um, that I think is very underused in uh, perfumery. And, you know, it can, um, it can also have this Christmas tree-like vibe to it, kind of similar to cypress in, in that regard, but almost like sharper. You know, there's something almost like, um, there's almost pier something piercing about it, if you will. Um, and, you know, extremely fragrant. And if you like spruce, I will tell you there's a Les Demodable fragrance that's called Oriental Velours. If I was going to buy one, that would be it. And the reason is, is that the spruce, you know, reminds me a little bit of the way that the spruce is used here. Oh, there's nothing similar about the two fragrances, but spruce is such an underused, under, um utilized note, if you will. And it adds this almost, yes, you know how, um, 
when you think about Christmas trees, sometimes you'll think about them with having like snow on them or something like that. It adds this element of like coolness. So imagine you keep the stickiness I was telling you about. Uh, you make it a sticky leather, but the green thyme and spruce and aldehydes almost adds this layer of coolness to the fragrance. But then you have this huge leather note, exactly the way I like it done. Oh, what a fragrance. Ted Lapidus Porome, 1978. My goodness. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, um, what can I say? I mean, um, um, this, this has almost left me speechless, and this is how it basically goes. That's how, that's the uh, box. Anyways, uh, Ted Lapidus Porome, number three. Number two. And there was no doubt. Number one and number two were almost no doubt. I tried to come up with uh, reasons as to why it would be different if I moved. And there's just no doubt. No doubt for me. Number two is Devon by Aramis. And if you love this, you have to smell Eugene's uh, Desandres. So Eugene's brand has a fragrance uh, that Antoine Lee made. Came out this year called Desandres. I have a video on it. Go check that out. But this is the grandfather of DeSandra's. And Devin, for me, is here because I think this is my favorite use of a Shepra fragrance, but with this green galbanum note that was just kind of like the star of the 70s for, for the women's side. Many vintage women's Shepras use this green galbanum note. Think about Chanel number 19, right? This is the masculine Chanel number 19. And I know what people are going to say. They're going to say, no, this is, um, uh, you know, Bernard Chant's take on alliage. Okay, fine. But I'm just saying, when I think about Chanel number 19 for women being the galbanum fragrance for women, when I think of the galbanum fragrance for men, this is it. The way that that spicy, um, you know, this is also very leathery in, in the dry down, but it opens up with that genius aldehydic opening of Bernard Shaw that no one makes aldehydes like Bernard Shaw and that that way that the galbanum oh god what a fragrance this is man what an absolute stunner a stone cold stunner Devin is and now if somebody recently confirmed that this line of fragrances is discontinued by uh, Aramis, that they're only going to keep the original Aramis Aramis, which is a punch in the gut. So if you want these gentlemen collections line, now I think is the time to grab them. I think Anuj might still have bottles of this at Enchante Perfumes. And number one, how conveniently timed this was, because actually I was waiting to do this video until my package came yesterday from Cullen from um, Japan. Thank you, Cullen. Uh, seriously, mate. I mean, what an amazing gift. I actually put some of this on my daughter's wrist. I dabbed it on last night and she just, even though she was running around the house making hell, she's a three-year-old, she smelled like an absolute angel. And this is Opium by uh, YSL for women. Opium and Eau de Toilette. This is the original bottle. This is the original, actually Charles of the Ritz version. You can tell by the white writing on the bottom and the 80 proof right here. See the 80 proof? And my God, this, I think opium might be one of the greatest fragrances ever made, ever. I mean, up there with the all-time greats. I know I mentioned Shalimar earlier. Uh, I, I would put opium right there, just right at the top of the greatest fragrances ever made. This is a creation by Jean-Louis Suizak and Jean Amique. Um, and actually, Raymond Shailan gets a little bit of a shout out for creating that mandarin orangey top in the book, The Ghost Perfumer. He's not listed as a as a perfumer, but he gets a shout out. He was the one who created that orangey top of um, of opium, and they ended up mixing it with the the main notes to my nose are this clove. The clove in here is probably one of the best cloves you will ever smell. Oh my god! Oh, and probably one of the best myrrhs or or apopanax, which is known as sweet myrrh. The way that the myrrh and the apopanax and the incense and the and there's a little bit of castorium in here too. Don't don't let this fool you. This is not all ambers and resins. There's some castorium. There's vetiver. 
uh, and there's other fruits that mix with that, you know, orangey top. You get a little bit of plum, so you get a little bit of a shout out to Rochas Femme from back in the day, but you also get the peach, shout out to Mitsuko, and there's orris in here, there's rose, there's sandalwood, there's cinnamon. The cinnamon is very prominent as well. There's carnation, there's frankincense, amber, benzoin, cedar, cystus labdanum. So the, the main, you know, nuts and bolts of the fragrance is the resinous, ambery, vanilla dry down, right? So it's vanilla, it's cystus labdanum, it's tolu balsam, it's a poppinax, and it's myrrh. And those five notes basically make this one of the greatest orientals of all time. Maybe you, I mean, you could make the case for maybe the greatest oriental. Although for me, I, I couldn't take Shalimar off of that top spot as far as I'm concerned. But this is, every time I smell this, I'm just, it almost makes me shake. I mean, it makes me shiver. I'm just like, oh, fuck. Oh, I mean, I wish you guys could be smelling this along with me. Like, as a perfume lover, I wish you could smell this. And I have a bottle. I brought this, too. This is the Eau de Toilette in the bottle from about 20 years ago. And it just says, inflammable, flammable. That's a way you can kind of tell a time period, too. You saw the same thing when I showed you the Van Cleef and Arpels. This uh, inflammable, flammable thing on the bottom, the way that they wrote that, I think that signifies kind of a time, right? And uh, I think these are like 20 years old, 20, 22 years old, somewhere around there, right? Um, but even this is an, oh God, you know, even this one is just one of the best fragrances I've ever smelled. It doesn't matter which version that you go for. Um, from my experience, opium is one of the most narcotic, amazing, animalic, spicy, oriental fragrances. Slightly floral, but mostly the focus is on the fruits, the clove, and, you know, the, the myrrh and stuff like that. So, so yes, this is um, number one, no doubt about it. Not even a thought in my mind. All of these amazing fragrances, nothing can top this to me. This is number one from, from the years 1976 to um, 1978. So probably next video, we'll only have two years, 79 and 80, and then 81 is going to have its own video. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate the support. Like the video before you leave. It does help with, the, with whatever algorithm YouTube uses. We're getting a lot of new people kind of watching these, and I think we're getting a lot of clout in the community. People are starting to pay attention, uh, whether they're actually saying anything. I think they're really watching in the background. So you know, we're making a dent slowly. I mean, people are noticing um, our little community that we have. And to be fair, we have an amazing community. Uh, I have the best 3,000 subs to begin with that a guy could start with. And never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I would come across so many caring and sharing people. I mean, Cullen sent me this for free as, as a thank you, Ramsey, for everything that you do. Never in a million years would I thought someone would send me a you know, original Charles of the Ritz opium bottle for free. I mean, people just don't do that, right? That's not the kind of uh, people you usually run across in the real world. It's almost like our little community of vintage fragrance lovers is vintage in of itself. Not that they're old, but that they're like vintage at heart. You know what I mean? Like times used to be when you would sleep with your windows open and your doors unlocked and you knew your neighbor. And that's the feeling that the people in the community have given to me. There's always going to be one or two outliers, but I've just learned to just block those people. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the people I've come across have been just amazing. And I'm so glad to make connections with everyone. I try to respond to every single comment that you leave. Uh, and we're still small enough that I can do that. I put my emails and in, in Instagram and in, in the description of every video. Anyone can kind of reach out to me, and I really want to make it a little bit of a community. I'm thinking about maybe making like a Facebook page. Uh, I don't know how. I would need some help from someone who knows what the hell they're doing, but I'm thinking about maybe like making a Facebook page where we could communicate and trade with each other and sell to each other inside of our little RAM Ram pen, uh, or Ram barn inside of our little community, you know? Uh, so again, 
Thanks everybody for being here. Hopefully a live stream soon, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, but uh, live stream soon with some testing of some new fragrances. And let me know what your favorites are from the year 76, 77, 78. Let me know what your favorites are from the list. Let me know if I left any out, because obviously I don't have everything. And um, thanks for being here. Do leave a comment. I love seeing your faces below. Thanks a lot. Cheers, guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. I love doing this. One of my favorite videos to do so far. So thanks again. Bye now.